In today's video, we're going to go over a 1964 lecture by Neville Goddard titled One Greater Than John. Now, the reason I'm doing these videos is because I truly believe that you must clean the inside of the cup and then the, uh, then the outside will be clean. I do not believe for a second that you could do all these external things and somehow they're going to affect your internal, that you're focusing on the external, which is the world, by the way, and ignoring the internal and hoping that by doing external things or by focusing your attention on words and history and whatever other people are doing, saying, and thinking, that that's somehow going to make a difference. It doesn't. I can tell you it doesn't. But, you know, hey, you, you believe what you want to believe, and I'm just hoping... You know, that people who want to experience Christ in them, experience the kingdom of God in them, that they may pay attention and, you know, check it out. Anyway, so this is a January 9th, 1964 lecture by Neville Goddard titled, One Greater Than John. Let's begin. Tonight's subject is One Greater Than John. I think you will find this the most practical approach to, to this teaching. When we open the Bible, we think it is just a normal book. May I tell you, it's not. It is divine history, and all the characters in, scriptures, in Scripture represent states of consciousness, from Adam to Jesus, everyone. They're not individuals as you and I are. They're simply representatives or personas of these states of awareness. And the very last before the page turns into an entirely new age is called John. And so we are told in the earliest Gospels, which, which is Mark, after John was arrested, Jesus came preaching the Gospel of God, John 1, 14. After John was arrested, then he, appears, then he, Jesus, appears preaching the Gospel of God. What is this story trying to tell us? So here, let me share with you my experience. I didn't know it either, but I'll tell you how this thing works. John, we are told, is the very last of the great prophets. As we're told, of those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the least in the kingdom is greater than he, Matthew 11:11. 11, 11. None greater than John in this world, yet the least in the kingdom is greater than he. And John came not eating or drinking. If you take that on this level, on the flesh and blood level, that's nonsense, because the body could not survive. Another gospel states, he came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. That tries in some way, well, to explain that he did not eat or drink. Well, there's no statement in the law of Moses against eating bread or drinking wine unless, one, unless you're one of the Nazareans, and it's, it's true as to wine, but certainly not eating bread. The Last Supper was the eating of bread and the drinking of wine. But he came neither eating bread, if you want to take it that way, nor drinking wine. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they called him a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But we think this night of one greater than John, who was the greatest in this world, yet not equal to the least in the world called the kingdom of heaven. Now, these are only states of consciousness to which every man, must, every man passes. If you are not now in the state of John, may I tell you, you're going to be sometime in the state of John. If not now, in this present little environment, when the wheel turns and it returns, you will be in that state. Everyone passes through the state of John before he comes into the state of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the state of John? We come into this world. Now let me share with you my own personal experience. I was born in a very limited environment, a small little island in the West Indies called Barbados. My father ran a little grocery store, but it was a general store, not only groceries, but meat, fish, fowl, liquor, wine. I mean, it supplied everything for the table. I was raised in that environment where it seemed the most normal, natural thing in this world to eat anything that was placed on the table, so I did. I left Barbados at the age of 17 and came to America, believing, as I did, everything placed before me was edible and was right. 
And then I fell into a state called John. John came not eating or drinking. And then I fell into the state where I gave up all the things that I did normally as a boy right through until I was 17 years old. I fell into the state at the age of 20. A little after 20, say 21, where I would not eat any meat, any fish, fowl, or even eggs. Naturally, in those days, I didn't drink, so I was not giving up wine, but that couldn't, but that couldn't cross my lips. I did violence to my own appetites because as a child, as a boy, I indulged in everything that my father placed before me. And suddenly, I gave it up, and for seven years, I was a strict vegetarian, a teetotaler celibate. John represents that state in man's ongoing when he does violence to his appetite. And yet life is nothing more than the appeasement of hunger. God gives to every man in this world a hunger that he can, if he knows God's law, satisfy. He can clothe himself with fulfillment of his dream and satisfy it. But there's a state where a man passes through, and it's called John the Baptist, where he does violence to his appetite. I met a friend of mine in New York City. His name was Abdullah. He said to me in 1933, I met him in 1929, and he did everything. He ate everything. He drank everything. He didn't smoke only because he didn't enjoy it, but he did everything. An old, old man he was then in his late 80s when I met him. And he said to me, so you're going to Barbados? You want to go to Barbados? I said, yes. Now this is where the good news of the kingdom comes in. Then when I met him, I did not eat flesh in any form. I did not drink alcohol in any form and no smoking and celibate. He said, well, well then, you're now in Barbados. I said, I'm in Barbados? This is on 72nd Street in New York City, where the buildings can go 30 and 40 stories high. Barbados, if you find a three-story building, you're lucky. The little one and two-story buildings and a sidewalk, but probably not even a sidewalk. One little tiny street we call Broad Street, to this day we call it Broad Street, and that's the only place that has a sidewalk. All other areas, no sidewalks. You walk in the street or you walk in the gutter. There's no such thing as a sidewalk. And he said to me, now clothe yourself with Barbados. Put it on as you would another garment, just as you would another garment, so that you could smell the tropics and you would see what you would see were you in Barbados. Well, I did to the best of my abilities and I clothed myself with Barbados. And when I thought that, uh, that night, the first night I clothed myself with Barbados, I thought of New York City, and I saw it 2,000 miles north of me. Then I had succeeded in clothing myself with Barbados. I fell asleep in the assumption that I am in Barbados. Well, the days went on from this, I would say, late October through November, and I'm yet, net, yet not physically in Barbados. So I tried to open up my discussion with Abdullah, and I said, Ab, I did all you told me. I clothed myself with Barbados. I am sleeping in Barbados, and yet here I am in New York City. He would not talk to me. He turned his back on me. The very first time I brought it up, he walked towards the studio, slammed the door in my face. And if you knew Abdullah, I knew, as I knew him, this was no invitation to come in. So, if I am clothing myself in Barbados and with Barbados, then I must be faithful to this clothing. That's the good news spoken of after John is arrested, not before. John is doing violence, trying to gain the kingdom of heaven by being good. And he said to me, you're so good, you're good for nothing. And you're trying to get into the kingdom by being good. You don't eat meat, no kind of meat. You don't drink alcohol, any alcoholic liquor. You're so, so good. And you're celibate at the age you are today and all the fires you've bottled up in you trying to be good. So I kept on wearing my garment. I am in Barbados. On the morning of the 4th of December, a letter came to my door, stuck under, the, stuck under the door, from my brother, giving me reasons why he wanted me to come to Barbados, and enclosed in that letter a ticket for Barbados. I had not gone home to Barbados in 11 years. I made no request. I didn't write my family. My brother Victor writes me, saying that you must come and know 
response other than yes would he accept and enclosing a little draft to buy shirts if I need them or a pair of shoes and stating in the letter that to use the check to the fullest advantage charging everything and I went and I, I, I arrived in Barbados well he would board the sh he would board the ship and pay all expenses that all I had to do was sign for it if I use the bar use the bar he didn't know I wasn't drinking but all expenses the tipping of the steward the tipping of everyone in the ship he would board the ship take care of all my expenses but I must come then he gave me his reasons for it he justified why I went down to that ship the morning of the 6th and got my passage and off I went Be before I went Abdullah said to me so you're going to Barbados may I tell you you're going to die but you will not surely die but you will die he didn't explain like Blake he never would tell me the interpretation of his statement you will die well I went off thinking well I'll die die in Barbados I didn't die in Barbados but I died I died to everything that I was doing I lived in Barbados for three months which is the Christmas season and everyone is entertaining I'm returning from America after 11 years and party after party is given to me in my honor for Christmas it's New Year's they're all drinking and having fun and I simply drank water mother prepared all kinds of meals and I would just have a vegetable meal she never heard of it we were raised supplying the entire island with mish, fish fowl meat everything with all the wine everything was home I just said no nope, I'll take vegetables and I was there for about three months I came back to the ship going north and the night I entered that ship we sat maybe six or eight people at a table and we all introduced ourselves my name is Neville Goddard and so I would shake hands with this one and so and so you all introduce yourself aboard the ship then the man to my right said to the waiter let us see what you have for wine the waiter brought the wine list he said well I have that I didn't say wine so he ordered that wine then came the first course soup so I didn't ask if there was meat stock in this soup as I'd done for seven years I just drank the soup then he brought the second course and it was fish I ate the fish he brought the third course and it was meat I ate the meat all the time pouring down the wine everything that I had not done in seven years I did that night and then from then on for the 10 12 days at sea till I got off the ship in New York City then I understood what he meant you will die the state called John the Baptist which does violence to itself you must pass through it if you are not now in it you will be in it it's part of the eternal drama of God God has prepared a way to redeem himself it's God and only God playing all these parts so God has prepared the way to bring himself back individualized as you there's no other way so from Adam to Jesus Christ there are only states of awareness through which God and only God passes and the last state of the old dispensation is John the Baptist that is the last stage and so man must pass through that state don't try to invite it it just happens and you don't understand why it happens in my own case raised normally with all the food before me because my father made a living feeding us by selling this fish fowl meat eggs butter everything that was normal all the rum in the world oh by the way we make rum in Barbados he drank it heavily my father was a very heavy drinker all these things I was exp was exposed to us and so we took it and suffered it my father the depths of my own being moving me through all these furnaces put me into a state where I was married at the age of 18 father at 19 separated at 20 and then I became so disillusioned with marriage I vowed that I would not have a thing to do with sex my own disillusionment my own not her own my own that was part of the play where he put me through these furnaces and brought me out seven years later I know friends of mine who have been in that state of John the Baptist for 50 years and have died in it but the wheel turns they will come out the wheel turns although they cease to be here in the flesh and flesh and blood being they were in it when they died others came out 
after 40 years. Here was George Bernard Shaw. He died in it after 70 years. He was 90 years old when he died. He was a strict vegetarian and a teetotaler. He was in it, but he, but he died in it. He had not come out of it. He died not believing in Christ. He died an atheist. He didn't know the good news. My friend Abdullah, who taught me this story, he was in it 40 years. He hadn't touched anything that was meat, especially pork. He was born and raised in the Jewish faith, and for 40 years he touched nothing that was meat. But certainly, not 40, year, for not 40 years, but came up to the... But from the time of birth came up until almost 80 years old. He had never eaten pork. And then came the same thing to him that happened to me. So man passes through this state called John the Baptist. And he comes into the state called Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the freedom of the world. So it said John came not eating or drinking. But it is said Jesus, but it said of Christ, called the son of man, he came eating and drinking. And they say of him, Behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So you pass through it, and then you know what he is talking about. He doesn't come to destroy the law. He said, Not one little dot would be rubbed out of the law, all will be fulfilled. But he interprets the law as John could not interpret it. John thought by doing violence to his appetites, he would get into the kingdom. He thought that he could scare a man into salvation. And at the next state beyond, John tells you, you can't do it that way. He interprets the law and shows you the law as something that is mental, not physical. He puts it this way. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed the act of adultery in his heart. Matthew 5, 27. He takes it from a physical state to a mental state. If I look upon a woman lustfully and I think I can get away with it, and it seems pleasant, I may be inclined to do it. If I contemplate that act along with its consequences for myself and my family, I may restrain the impulse. But he tells me that's not good enough. In the contemplation of the act, I did it. So causation is mental, not physical. John did not know that. We call The state called John didn't know that. If I restricted myself and resisted the impulse, I thought, well, am I not wonderful? I have just abided the law. You shall not do whatever. Then comes the next state called Jesus Christ. And that state tells me that wasn't good enough. The wheel is turning and you are going to do it tomorrow. The wheel will turn now and tomorrow. And when it turns all over again, you will be performing the act. And you'll wonder... Why has this happened to me, the disgrace of my family and myself? Because you thought by restraint of the act, you didn't do it. And now he interprets the law for us and tells us the very contemplation of the act was the act. And so when one gets to the point where they don't even contemplate it, well, then off the wheel of reoccurrence, we are lifted one by one by one. And that is a story of one that is greater than John. So everyone is moving through a series of states, and it starts from Adam through, well, we can stop, we can stop the Adam and start it from Abraham, for that's where real civilization begins. So you start from Abraham, and you come all the way into Jesus Christ, and there are only states of consciousness where God passes through individualizing himself as you, and everyone goes through the state called John the Baptist. So, of all those born of women, none is greater than John, yet least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. So how great we are in this world, that doesn't really matter, because the least in the kingdom of God has a greatness beyond the wildest dreams of this world. The least has greatness. You can't conceive the greatness of the least in the kingdom. And he's brought there, not by anything he's done, for may I tell you, I did nothing to to do it. I fell into it. But who made me fall into it? God. And so we can't take any credit for having fallen into the state called John. It seemed to me, if I reflect upon it, prior to when I fell into it, that I was disillusioned in marriage. 
a young man of 18 getting married and then being a father at 19 and then at 20 separate and becoming disillusioned, then pledging myself not to have anything to do in the sexual world and then to give up completely all the food that I loved. I love food. I love all things that are that this world could offer. And then to go through it and a man would tell me on a certain day you're going to die but not really die. And then you're bewildered. I'm going to die, but I'm not going to die? What is he talking about? Well, he was talking about the state. I will die to that state. And when, after the things happened, and I said to him, what did you mean, and who told you that I would die and yet not really die? He said to me, the brothers. That's all he would tell me. The brothers told me that you would die and not really die. The brothers told me you were coming to me. And what did he mean by the brothers, the Elohim, the gods who made us all in their own image? So tonight, may I tell you, let me share with you the good news. You are told the very first words given into the world in the mouth of Jesus Christ and the earliest gospel is in Mark 14th and 15th verses. The words are, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled the kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe in the gospel the first words put into his mouth someone asked the other night concerning changing of the picture of the world is repent in the first statement made in the gospel repent is a radical change of attitude towards anything that happens to you in this world I don't care what's happening repent don't let it happen as it is happening Change it in your mind's eye solely, as I did in New York City, without one nickel in my pocket, not a nickel. And Barbados is 2,000 miles away, across the water, so you can't walk. And he tells me, you are now in Barbados. I'm in Barbados, and Barbados is 2,000 miles across the water. Clothe yourself with Barbados. If you were in Barbados, how would you know you are? Look at the world. For motion is relative. I can only detect that I have moved relative to something that is stationary to my motion. So New York remains where it is. And if I assume that I am, Bar- I am in Barbados, I think, I think of New York. When I think of New York, I should see it 2,000 miles to the north of me. So I clothe myself with Barbados and think of some stopping place where I am in Barbados. That vision would tell me where I am. So I think of Barbados, and there it is, 2,000 miles to the north of me. So I sleep in that state to find that someone 2,000 miles away is moved to bring me a ticket to go to Barbados with a little small check to buy necessary things to get aboard the ship. So you clothe yourself in a state. That's the good news. I bring you the good news of the kingdom of God. For a man is rising into a kingdom where everything is subject to his imaginative power. But before you get there, You start to test it here, and you test it. So I'm telling you of a kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom of God. Well, what is it? It's a place beyond the wildest dream of earth. The world of Caesar, where when you arrive there, everything is subject to your imaginative power. But I'll tell you, start it right here. How do you do it? You clothe yourself with the state just as though it were true. And as you clothe yourself with it, wait. As you're told, those who really believe do not, and then there was an inaudible in this recording. If they really believe it, they don't make it so. It is so. That's why when I discussed with Abdullah, he never discussed it with me. When I asked him how would I go there, he wouldn't even answer me. Because what he was trying to show me was, if you really are clothed with the feeling of being in Barbados, How could you and I sit down and discuss how you're going to get there? How can we possibly discuss this? And so he wouldn't discuss it with me. If you're really going, if you're really doing what I told you to do, you say you're in Barbados. Well, then you can't discuss how you're going to go. If I said it to you, you are now rich and today you owe rent. Can you discuss and I discuss how you're going to become rich if I tell you that you are? and then ask you to clothe yourself with wealth? If I ask you to clothe yourself with any state in this world, and then it doesn't hatch out tomorrow because tomorrow is not the moment of hatching out, 
but you're really anxious and you say to me, but where is it coming from? How will it come? Should I really discuss that with you? Would not that is a lack of faith on your part? Well, I'm wearing it. And if I'm wearing it, it should be just as real to you as this room is real. That is the good news of the kingdom. If you really want anything in this world, I clothe myself with it just as though it were true. Then let it hatch out. All things have moments between the moment of assumption and the fulfillment of that assumption. We either believe it or we don't believe it. And not a thing I can do to persuade you to believe it. I can just simply throw it out. And in this audience this night, there are those who will accept it and there are those who will reject it. Not a thing I can do about that. I can only tell you of the kingdom of God and tell you these are states through which we pass. So, I hope you've passed through the state of John the Baptist. But it makes no difference. If you haven't passed through, I'll tell you what, you will pass through it. And so, when the wheel turns as it will turn, for all come to the inevitable end, and so everyone will make their exit from this world. And if they haven't, before they exit from this world, pass through John the Baptist, they will when the wheel comes back again to pass through it. For there is no death. Nothing dies in God's world. It seems to die, but the world does not end where my senses seem to disappear from it. It doesn't. So if the wheel is turning and turning, and you and I are turning on, on the wheel until by, except after John the Baptist, before we are plucked from the wheel, we begin to live by the promise called the gospel or the good news of God. So here this night, you take it and test it. If you test it, I may tell you, you'll prove it in its performance. If you don't test it, eh, you'll never know. And so it is Christ in you that you must test. Christ became man, God became man, that man may become God. So this is John the Baptist spoken of in scripture. Not a little man born of Elizabeth who is a cousin of Jesus. Forget that. These are only related states. A cousin is a relative. And so these are related states. That's all. It hasn't a thing to do with my cousin born of my sister. No, that's not the cousin. They were cousins separated in time. John came before and Jesus followed. Jesus is not a man. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan. God's promise, God's purpose, where he comes forward and awakens as himself, and that self is Jesus Christ. So, the last state man passes through is John the Baptist, where he does violence to himself. Now, he is clothed in camel's hair and a leather girdle. The most extreme parts of a man is hair and skin. So, he's clothed in a camel's hair and a leather girdle. So, here, he's the most external thing that a man could have on a body would be camel's hair and a leather girdle. And he said, if you will accept it, he is Elijah come again. Go back and read the story of Elijah. He is clothed in camel's hair and a leather girdle. It means that the mind is clothed with something external. I think if I give to the poor, if I contribute to the church, if I go to church every Sunday, if I do all the external things that I am now getting into the kingdom of heaven. So I abide by all external things. And that doesn't get me any place, especially not into the kingdom of heaven. Then I begin to do violence to my appetite. I restrain the impulse to do this, that, or the other, not knowing that life itself is nothing more than the appeasement of hunger. And God, and only God, gives me the different hungers. And the final hunger he gives me is the hunger for the word of God. The very last hunger, as told in the book of Amos, I will send a famine upon the world. It will not be for bread or a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God, Amos 8, 11. And so the last hunger to come upon man is to hear the word of God. To hear it is to experience it. I want to experience the reality of what is said in scripture. And so I will hear it and I'm hungry to hear it. I will experience it. Then comes a man's individual experience. So man must experience scripture for him to understand how wonderful it is. When he experiences scripture, the hunger that preceded the experience is now satisfied by that experience. <clears throat> and so that is what comes out when he enters into the state called Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is the flower, the fulfillment of God's purpose. So in the end, there's nothing but Jesus Christ. So then we are told in that day or on the day the Lord is one and his name one, and that name is Jesus. All come out as he, but they must pass through the state called John the Baptist. And John is but a state. And all must pass through that state doing violence to themselves in hopes that in some way it is seen by someone above him. And that seeing he enters in a state called salvation. But you cannot save yourself. No man can save himself. It is the gift of grace. It is the gift of God. You could this very moment become the most strict vegetarian in the world. Teetotaler, non-smoker, celibate. Go to the extreme state and make yourself so impotent that you couldn't possibly even entertain a thought. And yet you cannot, by such violence to yourself, enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is entered by grace. But you pass through the violence to self, and then you come out. May I tell you, when you do come out, there will always be those who mock you. Always those. So when he comes into the world, they call him a glutton. They call him a drunkard, the friend of sinners. And may I tell you, when I came back after seven years of this rigid discipline, and those who saw me in this meeting one night, when I got up and suddenly confessed what I'm doing now, that a few ladies in the audience cried because they thought they, hadn't, they had some personal savior, and I had become to them an image that cracked and broke. They saw me in utter failure, one who normally drank and normally ate meat. To them, I was, I was a complete disillusioned being, and it happens to every being in this world. You'll pass through it. I'm sharing with you my own experience, and no man can speak with any greater authority than when he speaks from experience. For a truth that a man knows from experience, he knows more thoroughly than he knows anything else in this world. And he can know that same truth any other way. So if I tell you of this experience, you may believe me or you may not believe me. Even those who believe me will not know it to the extent they will know it unless they themselves experience it. And so you pass through. But don't encourage it. Don't this night say, I will simply go on a vegetable diet and I will give up liquor, I'll give up smoking, I'll give up sex in the hope that I, I'm going to pass through that state. It doesn't come that way. It comes in a strange way. It came to me in the strangest way. I ordered the most wonderful roast beef, may I tell you. I was in Syracuse, New York, and I love my meat. I ordered the most wonderful roast beef, and I put my knife into it, and I actually felt I was cutting the animal alive. I took the plate and pushed it away. I could not take one piece from that plate. For seven years, I couldn't eat meat. So it happened that way. I couldn't touch a piece of meat, a piece of fowl, an egg, fish for seven years. But it happened, and I was a vegetarian for seven years. And I ordered, uh, and I ordered from the menu roast beef as I always loved it. And as it was delivered, I thought it would be marvelous. But as I put my knife into it, I was cutting into the animal. And I pushed it again. I pushed it away for seven years. That's how you pass through the, the state called John the Baptist and then come into the state called Jesus Christ. But before you are lifted off the wheel, you must prove that this is good news. And good news is that everything in this world you want, you can have and you can clothe yourself with. It doesn't mean you're lifted off the wheel. But clothe yourself with it. You want to be rich? How would you feel for, if you were rich? Do you want to be healthy? How would you feel if you were healthy? You want to be free of all embarrassment? How would you feel this night if you were not embarrassed? That not a thing in this world could embarrass you. How would you feel if it were so? And you clothe yourself with these states. And one after the other. And be faithful to the clothing that you wear. And let it unfold in your world. And it will completely unfold in your world until you see it. Then, as you practice with it and actually believe the good news of the kingdom of God, suddenly, when you least expect it, one after the other, a series of events that God predetermined to awaken himself will awaken within you. Because God has prepared a way for himself to return individualized as you. Completely prepared. And no one could stop the way. He's prepared that way. And so at the end, all of a sudden, the series begin to unfold, and you are unfolding. 
and you are he, and the one who became you and took himself through the furnaces, all through John into Jesus Christ, and you awake as he. There's not a thing I can tell you to persuade you to accept that. I wouldn't raise a finger to make it so because I'm not convinced by speculation. I'm convinced by knowing, and I have experienced it. And so, if the, te- if the, if the great teachers of the church of the world stood before me in opposition, it would make no difference to me whatsoever. They, too, will pass through all these states because they aren't elected to these states by men. So the heads of all the great churches of the world, if they stood before me now, I would say to them, if you have not experienced it, you will. And your greatness in this world is nothing. It is nothing. For the least in the kingdom is greater than you. And the least in the kingdom has a greatness that you cannot measure by anything on this earth. And if you have not experienced this, no matter how great you are with all your medals pinned on you by men who vanish into the world as nothing, But the day will come. You'll go through John the Baptist. He's not a man who lived 2,000 years ago. He represents a state of consciousness that's eternal through which every soul must pass. And passing through, they do violence to their appetites. They come out of it and enter a state called Jesus Christ. They believe the story of the good news of God and actually prove it in performance. They prove it and prove it until that moment in time when they're lifted off the wheel of recurrence and they enter the kingdom of God. But here we are told concerning John, the law and prophets until John. It starts from the great law and all through the great prophets until John, Matthew eleven thirteen, there comes a stop. From then, the good news of the kingdom is preached and everyone enters the kingdom violently. I read here in the most recent scholarly works of this passage, which is 16th chapter, the 16th verse verse of the book of Luke. And these great scholars, and there were hundreds of them in discussion, and they have confessed it doesn't make sense. It only adds confusion to confusion based on an earlier passage that they can't understand what he means that all of a sudden everyone enters the kingdom violently. And this thing happens after John. Well, may I tell you, it's true. It happened to me. I can't tell you how violent you are when you enter. Not angry, but sheer, sheer energy. You use a power that you have never heard of on earth. We speak of power of blowing up a whole city or with a bomb or blowing up a country with a bomb. No, it doesn't compare to the power that you exert in that moment of entrance into the kingdom of God. When you are whipped up in the form of a spiral into your own skull, and it is through and through it, takes that energy to ram you into the eternal structure that God has predetermined, as though the whole vast skull is being filled, and you fill one niche forever and forever. But you move into it with such power, the whole thing radiates, the whole thing shakes like an earthquake, as though the whole vast world is an earthquake. And then suddenly... When you are completely in it and then riveted in it, it subsides and all is quiet. And you return to here, you return here to the world of Caesar. So the world is stating that in the 16th, the word, the, uh, the world is stating that in the 16th verse of the 16th chapter of Luke, everyone enters it violently. May I tell you, it must, because it takes an enormous power to drive you into that prepared for you. It's been waiting for you since the beginning of time, and you move into that one part prepared for you, and you move in so forcibly the whole structure vibrates, then it subsides, and you're back. So, you go home this night, clothe yourself in the joy of being the man or the woman that you want to be. I tell you, it will not fail you. Now let us go into the silence. Now after that, they have a period of about a minute or two of silence. And then Neville usually had a question and answer session from the audience. Now, unfortunately, the questions here are inaudible. So I'll just give you the answers. Again, question and audible. He says, yes, my dear, certainly. The lady's question is, do you think we could have gone through the state of John in a life before this? Why, certainly. I wouldn't doubt that for one moment and come out of it knowing that these things are not necessary for the kingdom of God with all the temptations of this world. 
for we have all kinds of cults in this world who are playing as a cult. They don't know it's the state called John the Baptist, inviting everyone into it. They give up wearing fur, they give up eating meat, they give up drinking, smoking, give up sex, and they're all inviting us into that cult. And they call themselves houses of religion. But people are persuaded to enter that. And then they give up all these things and do violence to their appetites. You might have passed through that. I'm not saying that you did or did not. So I'm saying to you, to answer your question, certainly many of us could have gone through that state in this world tonight. And you could be called into the kingdom of heaven because you're told when the question was asked, tell me, Lord, is it now that you will restore the kingdom of Israel? And he corrected their question and answered, it's not for you to know the times or the season, which is fixed by God by his own authority, but you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Acts 1, six. Therefore, wait for the promise. Just wait for it. You could have gone through it this very night. It's my constant hope that everyone who hears me this very night lifted it into the experience because I can't tell anyone the thrill of being aware of the fact that you are part of the kingdom of God. And there should be no delay beyond that moment when God calls you. And I'm quite sure there is no delay. Another inaudible question. Answer, well, my dear, when this thing happens from above, you are awakened from this deep, deep sleep. Question. Inaudible. Oh, I didn't even know I was asleep. I didn't know when I was awakened in my skull to find myself completely enclosed within my skull. And my skull is a sepulcher. And it's not a tiny, a little tiny place like this here, for I only wear a size 7 hat. And I couldn't get into a size 7 hat. So it's, it's not this, but it is my skull. And so here I awake, I find myself waking. But unlike the usual waking, which comes every morning when I awake, this is something different. I'm, a, I'm waking, and I awake in my skull. My skull is a tomb, and it's a sepulcher. And, I, and here I am completely awake now for the first time in thousands of years, but I am entomb, entombed. That's the resurrection. The resurrection begins the whole drama. And when I come out, I am born like a child. The birth is symbolized of that of a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. So this series of events differs completely from all other mystical experiences.